It is evolution's most inspiring achievement, the power of flight. From insects to birds to bats, tens of thousands of species fill our skies. But hundreds of millions of years ago, flight did not exist. This is something that's only occurred four times in all of the evolutionary history on the planet. How did these animals come to seemingly defy the laws of gravity? How did they first take flight? kingdom is composed of millions of species and the fastest of all of them the peregrine falcon reaching speeds of more than 200 miles per hour this bird swoops down from more than a half a mile in the sky to attack with lethal precision the peregrine's tremendous speed and success at hunting can be attributed to one simple trait the power of flight. While humans have always dreamed of flying, evolutionarily, flight has passed us by. But incredibly, more than three quarters of all land animals can take to the air. From butterflies, to birds, to beetles, and bats. These vastly different organisms have all evolved the complex mechanism of getting and staying airborne. Flight occurs when an animal has enough lift and thrust to move its body through the air and to maintain it in the air. But what forces drove the development of such a remarkable innovation? When did the first animals take to the air? And how did they develop this ability to seemingly defy the laws of gravity? The sparks of this extraordinary evolutionary change can be seen all around us today. Insects. For millions and millions of years, nothing could fly. And so if a small invertebrate was moving around in the forest and wanted to find food, it had to crawl all the way up to the top of a tree and get the food and then go down that tree and up another tree to get food. But then suddenly something happens. The first flying organisms appear. And once flight becomes part of the game, it changes everything. The fossil record shows that insect flight evolved suddenly around 350 million years ago. Mutations in natural selection produced the first species with wings capable of lifting them into the air. This random evolutionary accident can now be seen in the anatomy of more than a million insects. Their wings have evolved to be like curved long helicopter blades, and the wing surfaces are not flat, which make them highly maneuverable in tight spaces so that they can easily find food and escape predators. Insects are very good at flying. They can hover, they can fly quickly, they can fly backwards, they can turn very tight turns, they can go very, very high, and they've taken advantage of this to fill all the different niches in the world. Although insects would be the first animals to fly, they would not be the last. To fly, an animal not only has to get up into the air, but once there, it has to be able to take in huge amounts of energy and oxygen to power them through the sky. Considering the physical demands, it's no wonder that the heaviest flying animal today, the great bustard, weighs in at a mere 45 pounds. If you watch birds of different sizes, especially when they try to take off from the ground, the first thing we usually notice is that large birds have trouble getting off of the ground. But one of the world's first flyers would break all the evolutionary rules about size. The first group of vertebrate flyers would produce the largest flying animal of all time, a 440-pound pterosaur called Quetzalcoatlus. This is Quetzalcoatlus, the largest flying animal of all time. With a wingspan of about 35 feet, this animal soared over Western North America when in full flight, its wingspan was equal to three cars parked bumper to bumper. Imagine that thing coming at you. 
The gigantic pterosaur had a huge beaked head the size of a human, and when standing on the ground, was taller than a giraffe. At four times the size of any flying animal today, it's an anomaly of evolution. What ecological pressures drove these enormous animals into the sky? And how was it physically possible? Weighing hundreds of pounds, it seems unlikely even its massive wings could have generated enough force to drive it into the air. Pterosaurs lived 220 million years ago and were the first vertebrates to evolve powered flight. Their name comes from the Greek pterosauro, meaning winged lizard. Unlike birds, these first vertebrate flyers did not have feathers, but skin that stretched from their pinky fingers to their backs to form a wing. The first vertebrate group to fly, to evolve flight, were the pterosaurs. They're closely related to dinosaurs, but not dinosaurs themselves. The world of the pterosaur was a strikingly different place than today. Dinosaurs tower above the canopy, while down below, millions of insects buzz around their feet, along with hundreds of species of reptiles, all competing for resources and food. The ability to fly opened up numerous new ecological possibilities for pterosaurs. One of the earliest ones was probably the ability to catch flying insects on the wing. So these guys could fly, pursue flying insects, grab them and eat them. Pterosaurs also look to oceans and lakes as a source of food. They fly over the water, swooping down for fish. Being in the air also gives them a better vantage point for spotting dead animals to scavenge. New food resources explain the desire for wanting to get up into the skies. But just how did these 440-pound behemoths get there? How an animal this big got off the ground and stayed into the air has been a puzzle ever since its discovery. Michael Habib is an evolutionary biologist at Johns Hopkins University. He thinks he's solved the mystery of how these monstrous reptiles conquered flight. In the late 1920s, a group of paleontologists unearthed a pterosaur skeleton on a dig in Oregon. Included in the skeleton was a seemingly ordinary bone from the wing. The bone was dismissed as insignificant and placed in a drawer in a museum for more than 80 years. But Habib believes this simple bone from the wing may hold the answer to these massive creatures taking to the air. The bone in question that was found is the most important part of the wing for understanding the flight of a pterosaur. It's the, the part that basically connects the wing itself to the, to the body. It's where most of the flight muscles attach. When I talked to the curators at the museum about the pterosaur collection, it was in fact the last thing they showed me. It was almost an afterthought. They had practically forgotten it was there. The bone was incredibly well preserved, and Habib sensed he may be onto something. Here, in front of him, could be the part of the anatomy that might just explain how an animal four times larger than anything else flying on Earth could generate enough force to get up into the air and stay there. Habib wanted to capture high-tech X-ray images of the interior of the fossil at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. The first thing Habib noted was something paleontologists have long known about the pterosaur's bones. They were hollow. Its hollowness allows the bones to be very, very large. That is, their diameters can be very wide. It makes them very strong. It means that they can put a lot of muscle power on them, and the bone will hold up. This bone, however, was not completely hollow. Habib noticed some strange growths inside the bone that looked like support beams similar to flying buttresses on a cathedral that keep the walls from buckling inwards. They're arranged in particular directions, and the direction shows you where the bone needed the most reinforcement, where it needed the biggest push from the inside to keep it from collapsing. With this discovery, Habib was able to figure out what this bone was used for. It was used to help launch pterosaurs, like the 440-pound Quetzalcoatlus, off the ground, much like a diver pushing off a springboard. Launching is actually very rigorous and very difficult for flying animals in the sense that they have to get a lot of speed built up in a very short period of time. 
To launch off the ground and into air, an animal has to generate a lot of force, which takes a lot of muscle power. In birds, you see this mostly in the hind legs, because in birds, it's actually not the wings that mostly get the bird off the ground. It's actually the legs. The legs give the initial leap that starts them into the air. The discovery of the internal brace system suggests that these front limbs were strong enough to push the pterosaur up off the ground and propel its huge body into the air. So their wings were more than just agents of flight. They were actually front legs that they used to walk around on and help them push off and into the air. Habib's discovery may go a long way to answering some of the lingering debate about how these large first vertebrate flyers got airborne. But the question remains, why is there nothing this big flying today? The answer may be the size itself of these animals. Large animals need more food to sustain themselves. And in times of environmental distress, catastrophe, animals like this, this 35-foot wingspan pterosaur, would have had a much harder time feeding itself than a bird a fraction of its size. Their size may have eventually led to their extinction. But 150 million years ago, another group of animals was independently evolving the ability to fly alongside the pterosaurs with different flight strategies naturally selected for their size and anatomy. Interestingly, small birds make up more than half the species of birds in the world. So in the evolution of birds, small birds have arguably been much more successful than their larger counterparts. The bird's inspiration? Not the flying pterosaurs, but flightless killers on the ground. 150 million years ago, during the mid-Jurassic period, life is teeming with new species, not only on the ground, but also far above in the skies. Two separate evolutions of powered flight has given rise to millions of species of insects, and pterosaurs have been soaring high above the canopy for over 100 million years. But they were no longer alone. A new class of creatures was evolving independently alongside them that would take flight to new heights. Convergent evolution is a phenomenon where organisms from two different ancestries evolve similar characteristics in response to similar environmental pressures. And the evolution of flight is an excellent example of convergent evolution. Birds and pterosaurs both evolve similar body plans in response to the need to fly more efficiently. From pigeon to peacock, eagle to sparrow, Today, there are over 10,000 species of birds on the planet, twice as many as mammals. Exactly when they evolved and how they adapted flight is a 230 million year old detective story. But if you know where to look, there are telltale clues. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Ironically, the answer to how birds took to the air may lie on the ground. Large, flightless birds like emus help trace the origin of avian flight because it is believed that birds evolved not from winged pterosaurs, but ground-dwelling dinosaurs. This animal, the emu, is one of the closest things left on Earth that might be able to tell us what non-avian dinosaurs really looked and acted like. For instance, look at the feet of an emu. You see scales on the feet like a reptile, and also three weight-bearing toes like a non-avian theropod dinosaur. Theropod dinosaurs stood upright with hind legs used for support and movement, while short forelimbs were used for grasping and tearing prey. The most famous was the fearsome T-Rex. If we were to look at the foot of a T-Rex and put a T-Rex foot next to the foot of this emu, you'd see many, many similarities and only a few differences. I think the most obvious feature that birds share with non-avian dinosaurs, um, a feature they inherited from non-avian dinosaurs, is their feathers. Feathers were long thought to be exclusive to birds among vertebrate animals. But this was not the case. Millions of years ago, some non-flying vertebrates had feathers too. So we now know that feathers are not unique to birds. Feathers first evolved in non-avian dinosaurs, and it's quite possible they evolved for something other than flight, possibly insulation, possibly brooding their nests. But aside from sharing feathers, how do we know that birds evolved from dinosaurs? And how were these land-based animals able to take to the skies? 
Over the last 200 years, paleontologists have begun to find amazing evidence that helps to answer these evolutionary mysteries in the form of incredibly preserved fossils. Pittsburgh's Carnegie Museum of Natural History houses one of the world's top collections of dinosaur bones. Among them are striking clues of how birds and subsequently bird flight evolved from dinosaurs. This is a cast of Archaeopteryx. And when this was discovered well over a century ago, it astounded scientists because the fossil shows a mixture of features classically associated with reptiles and classically associated with birds. Archaeopteryx was the first of a whole new group of animals. It was a bird distinguished from a feathered dinosaur by its ability to fly. Even though it may not have been very proficient in the air, there were clear differences in the anatomical structure of this creature compared to non-flying dinosaurs. As the world's oldest known bird, however, it naturally had not completely evolved away from its ancestors. Archaeopteryx, when we look at its skeleton, it shows many features that are retained from its dinosaur ancestors that are lost in modern birds. So for instance, if we look at the skull of Archaeopteryx, we see that it retains tiny teeth. All known birds alive today lack teeth. We also see a long, bony tail in Archaeopteryx, a dinosaurian feature. If we look at the hand of Archaeopteryx, we can see that its fingers are still tipped with large, curved claws. And this is a feature that dinosaurs have as well. In addition, Archaeopteryx also seem to be missing something else crucial, muscles. Modern birds have a series of large pectoral muscles that attach to their sternum and help them generate enough force to fly. Archaeopteryx didn't appear to have these muscles. So while their bodies could support some flight, it is unlikely they could stay airborne for very long periods of time. Archaeopteryx probably could fly, but compared to modern birds, was almost certainly very clumsy. And we know this because its skeleton is much more primitive than that of modern birds. So how did modern birds evolve to become more efficient flyers? What was the next evolutionary step after Archaeopteryx? In 2004, on a dig in northwestern China, Lamana and his colleagues came across another fossilized piece to the puzzle. The more I looked, it became clear that we were looking at a very bizarre group of birds that were abundant during the Cretaceous period, the final period of the age of dinosaurs. Close to 100 nearly complete skeletons of 100 million year old birds were recovered on the dig. Among them, a rare specimen. Tiny fragments of this long extinct animal called Gansas had been found before but never a skeleton as complete as this one. Gansas dates to 40 million years younger than Archaeopteryx, about 110 million years ago. And already, relatively rapidly in bird evolutionary history, Gansas has acquired many of the features that we associate with modern birds. It's in many ways an anatomically modern bird from 110 million years ago. Although Archaeopteryx was capable of flight, Lamana would soon discover that Gansas had anatomical features that almost certainly made it a far better flyer. A lot of the story of the evolutionary history of birds has to do with the increased efficiency of flight. So for instance, when we look at Archaeopteryx, we see features that are not present in modern birds, such as teeth and a long bony tail. And these are two features that have long been argued to have been lost in modern birds because they saved weight. Loss of teeth, a shorter tail, and other distinguishing features appears to make Gansas an intermediate animal between the largely dinosaurian Archaeopteryx on one side and modern birds on the other. But did the fossil have the pectoral muscles that could help it get airborne more easily than Archaeopteryx? Trouble was, although the Gansas fossil was complete, it was also badly flattened making it nearly impossible to see the certain anatomical features of this new species. Would critical questions to this mystery go unanswered? Fortunately, Lamana is able to turn to a team of paleo sculptors and artists at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History to try and recreate the image of this ancient bird. Working like crime scene investigators, the team is able to methodically reconstruct the crushed bones and create a picture of what Gansas would have looked like. 
As Lamana had hoped, Gansas appeared to have a body capable of supporting large, strong wings. The presence of a bony sternum on Gansas means that this creature would have most likely had larger pectoral muscles compared to the relatively puny ones seen on Archaeopteryx. Today, all flying birds have large muscles, similar to those found in Gansas. This provides them with the strength needed to flap their wings and get airborne. Could Gansas have been the evolutionary step to allowing birds to become more proficient flyers? This guy would have had pretty big pecs, you know, been able to flap his arms with quite a bit of force and probably was a pretty good flyer. The large breastbone that strong flight muscles could attach to is clearly seen in Gansas, as well as fused wrist and hand bones, a short bony tail, and fused ankle and foot bones, also traits in most modern birds. All these features transform these early flyers from a reptile that could get airborne to a radical new lineage that would spend the majority of its time in the air. Gansas was probably an excellent flyer, probably as good a flyer as are many types of modern birds. Birds are one of the most successful groups of vertebrates, but in order to survive in a new environment, major anatomical changes had to be made. What was useful on the ground would hold them back in the sky. When birds gained the ability to fly from dinosaurs, it came with some costs. They had to lose a few things. The most obvious of which is probably that they don't have any more hands. All the bones of the fingers are now incorporated in the wing, and there are feathers attached to them, so they can no longer manipulate anything with their hands or defend themselves on the ground. Regardless of this cost, however, the fossil record clearly shows that the evolutionary transition from dinosaurs to birds was a great triumph, and over time, birds radiate far and wide. These groups that evolved the ability to fly and diversified into hundreds or thousands of species have gone on to fill many different niches in the environment. Incredible fossils like Archaeopteryx and Gansas help us to understand what anatomical features define a bird and when they evolved. But what were the environmental factors that sent birds into the air? When we're trying to examine the origin of flight, of bird flight, we need to answer a couple of questions. And perhaps the biggest one is, what were the selective forces driving birds into the air? What was happening down on the ground that turned two-footed feathered dinosaurs into masters of the skies? Through the fossil record, we know that birds that were capable of flight evolved from dinosaurs over 140 million years ago. But the biggest mystery of all still remains. What forces would have driven land-based creatures to take to the skies? When somebody asks what was the behavior of a fossil, of course, we're reaching in to a, an area of speculation, to say the least. How do we explain each of the transitional stages from the bird's dinosaur history to today? Ken Dial, professor of biology at the University of Montana, thinks the answer of how flight first evolved lies not in the bones of long dead animals, but in the behavioral patterns of those that are living. What we're trying to do is we're trying to borrow from the present to try to interpret the potential behaviors of the fossil creatures. Dial and his colleague Brandon Jackson run an avian flight research center in the foothills of Montana. Their work focuses on uncovering the origins of bird flight. Why do birds need to fly? Why do they want to fly? Dial believes that birds evolved the power to fly slowly. Over time, environmental pressures like escaping predators pushed them towards the sky, and various physical adaptations allowed them to get there. If this is true, claims Dial, many birds may still be hardwired with the behavior of their land-dwelling ancestors inside. In other words, if given the choice between using their wings or their feet, birds will choose to remain on the ground. To test their hypothesis, Dial and Jackson put birds in a position to have to choose between flying and keeping their feet earthbound. 
They take birds that are fully able to fly and place them at the foot of a ramp with a steep incline. Here we go. What they observe is that these birds choose to run, keeping both feet grounded, rather than fly to the top of the ramp. Changing the steepness of the ramp does not alter the result. Starting with a 30 degree incline, then 60, 75, and finally 90. Each time the bird chooses to run instead of fly. When we look at the angle which they're trying to scale, we've come to learn something very, very special. And that is, if a bird is trying to ascend something that is less than 60 degrees, they can do so easily just with their hind limbs and with their wings tucked to their side. But as soon as they start to scale anything higher than about 60 degrees, you'll automatically see the wings jump in to the whole process. Dial has termed this behavior wing-assisted incline running. At these steeper inclines, the bird's flapping wings provide additional power to support the hind limbs and assist in keeping the bird's body from falling down the ramp. Instead of making a big jump from running on the ground to flying, running up inclines with the wings assisting their legs provides small incremental evolutionary adaptive stages for the birds to slowly grow larger and larger wings and more powerful flight apparatus. At a 90 degree angle, the wing beat frequency and force produced approaches that needed for flight. So if we were to take a bird running on a 90 degree ramp, a vertical ramp, and then take the ramp away, the bird would not have to change a thing. It wouldn't have to change its wing stroke angle, and it wouldn't have to change its wing beat frequency, and it would be flying. Could the desire to keep their feet on solid ground instead of flying be a remnant of their evolutionary past? We think that they have this ingrained in their neurocircuitry, that if their feet are touching the ramp, they have to run up it. It is possible that they stayed earthbound because for the millions of years before they could fly, their dinosaur ancestors were land dwellers. Dial and Jackson hope to get a clue as to how ingrained this behavior is in birds. They conduct the experiment again, this time using baby chicks that haven't yet learned to fly. The result? The same as with the adult flying pigeons, the baby chicks run up the ramp, and as the incline gets steeper, they flap their little wings harder and faster. Jackson believes that this behavior can explain the evolutionary steps that the dinosaur ancestors of birds, those without fully formed wings, may have taken to develop the adaptations needed for true flight. Over millions of years, most likely, Theropod dinosaurs went from running on level ground to running up shallow inclines. And when they hit 60 degrees, they had to start using their pre-wings, their flightless little forearms. Now, over millions more years, they moved from being able to run up 60 degrees to being able to run up 70 degrees, and then 80 degrees, and then finally vertical. The incremental steps over many millions of years produce bigger wings, stronger muscles, and more fine tuning of the wing stroke, which natural selection acts on, and bird flight evolves. What were the selective forces driving birds to develop a full wing and the ability to produce significant aerodynamic forces? One of the strongest selective pressures out there is the risk of predation. The ancestors of birds were small bipedal theropod dinosaurs. They only used their hind limbs for moving. To avoid predation, they could try and outrun a predator, or they could run up obstacles to get away. By gaining some kind of elevated refuge, they are safe. Over time, the chase between predator and prey grew more intense, and to get away, these small theropods had to develop the ability to run up steeper and steeper inclines to escape until they had the power needed for flight. Once in the air, away from the predators below, 
birds could also take advantage of other benefits, such as more diverse and readily available food sources. Flight allows birds to exploit niches that non-flying animals cannot exploit. The ability to soar over a prairie and hunt for small rodents like hawks and eagles do is only available as a niche to flying animals. Dial's experiment may have finally proven how and why birds first took to the sky. But how do they defy the laws of gravity and stay up there? Once birds had evolved and taken to the skies, the question still remains, how do they seemingly defy the laws of gravity and stay up there? The simple answer would seem to suggest by flapping their wings. But the evolutionary process that allowed birds to successfully take to the skies would require several unique physical adaptations. Insects, the first animals to fly, are very lightweight and so don't really require much energy to stay airborne. And unlike birds, they don't stay in the air for prolonged amounts of time. Vertebrate flyers like birds are bigger and need huge amounts of energy to be able to produce the aerodynamic forces needed to propel them forward. The primary engine to produce these forces for birds are their wings. In an airplane, you have an engine and a wing, and the engine produces forces to overcome drag, and the wing produces forces to overcome gravity. But in a bird, the wing produces both thrust and lift. Evolutionarily, birds have perfect physical features for life in the skies. Their wing is naturally curved on the top and relatively flat underneath. Lift is created by faster air flowing over the top causing it to be pulled up, as well as increased pressure pushing against the bottom of the wing. And when they flap their wings, they generate enough force to propel themselves through the sky and not just glide. As far as we know, birds produce all of their aerodynamic forces in the downstroke. So they move their wing from above their body using their pectoralis muscle, drive the wing down, and that produces all of the lift and all of the thrust. 95% of the power required for this downstroke comes from a single muscle, the pectoral muscle. On average, about one-fifth of a bird's body mass is devoted to this main muscle that powers flight. As this muscle evolved to get larger over time, it was able to create even more energy and make birds even better flyers. Also crucial to bird flight is orientation. Birds have the unique ability to always tell what is up and what is down when they are moving through the air, especially when they are turning. Airplanes have thousands of dollars worth of equipment to find the horizon, but birds don't have any of that. Instead, they have all of that in their head, in their brain. One thing that they have is essentially like an internal gyroscope. If you take a bird and rotate it, its head stays essentially level. This is in stark contrast to most mammals, which have a large muscle anchoring their skull to the neck, so the head goes where the body goes. So when birds turn, they bank their whole bodies, and they have to keep their head perfectly straight so that they don't lose track of where the ground is. But it may be another advancement that has proved the most crucial in birds evolving the power of flight. The key to virtually every land animal's success is the ability to process oxygen. In order to be able to have enough energy for flight, birds have developed a revolutionary use of oxygen. The problem is that they need to take in huge amounts of energy and oxygen. The secret lies in the bird's internal structure. Birds, like pterosaurs, have hollow bones that connect to sacs filled with air. These pneumatic bones are really the footprints in the skeleton of an air sac system. An air sac system is there to provide the oxygen that flight requires. What is an air sac system and how does it work? Vertebrate paleontologist Leon Klassens from the College of the Holy Cross studies this intricate system in various species of bird. Unlike mammalian lungs, which expand and contract when you breathe in and out, Lungs in birds are fixed in size. They never change in volume when fresh oxygen-rich air is inhaled, 
and used carbon dioxide rich air is exhaled. But what a bird has to actually move air around in its respiratory system is a whole series of what are called air sacs, which are balloon-like extensions that hook up to the various airways. By juggling air between these various air sacs, birds are capable of getting a highly efficient airflow through their lungs by continuously extracting oxygen from air stored in the sacs, both as they breathe in and also when they breathe out. At Harvard University's Concord Field Station, Klassens and his associates use an X-ray video technique called cineradiography to observe how this unique air sac system works. Klassens positions the bird inside the device where the video captures images of the air sacs at work. You can see right here on this film that as the rib cage enlarges, the majority of these air sacs, and especially the ones toward the tail end of the animal, greatly increase in size. These air sacs allow the animal to continuously shift air around as and when they need it, and provides them with a highly efficient breathing apparatus that is unique to birds. You see right here, with anatomy in action in the living animal, one of the most elegant and most efficient designs that is present in any living vertebrate and any living backboned air-breathing animal. All living birds today have air sacs, and there is evidence that they were present in some dinosaurs. So they must have evolved long before birds ever took to the skies. In large dinosaurs, such as Tyrannosaurus, you have evidence for the presence of air sacs because you have openings in the bones where parts of these air sacs have invaded the bones. Anatomy that had already evolved in ground-running dinosaurs, like air sacs and feathers, was fine-tuned by natural selection to produce great flyers. This unique anatomy would pave the way for 10,000 species of birds to populate every continent on Earth. But 55 million years ago, one group of mammals with none of the features that birds have was about to conquer the skies in a whole new way. When the sun sets, the majority of birds retreat from the sky and give way to an entirely different animal. The fourth and final lineage to evolve the power of flight are the masters of the night, bats. Bats are the only mammals who have not remained ground-dwelling creatures. More than just freaks of evolution, bats are one of its greatest success stories. With over a thousand species worldwide, they make up 20% of all mammals. Bats evolved the power of flight in an entirely unique way. Without any of the features that make birds so successful, feathers, hollow bones, or even air sacs. Birds and bats are completely separate in their evolutions. They each represent the arrival at flight by a different evolutionary pathway. But what forces drove them to be the lone mammals in the air around 55 million years ago? And how did they manage to do something very few birds ever could, take to the sky at night? We're pretty confident that bats evolved from some kind of ancestor that was a glider that used flaps of skin to move through the air without flapping. Six groups of gliding mammals still exist, from marsupials to the flying lemur and the flying squirrel. But only bats evolved powered flight. Exactly why remains a mystery. But Sharon Swartz, who studies bats at Brown University, thinks it had something to do with their ancient gliding lifestyle. One major function of gliding is that it provides an excellent way to escape predators at a moment's notice. Physically, bats acquired the power of flight in a very distinct way from birds. When they evolved, they retained the five independent digits of a mammalian hand, which were covered in skin to make a wing. Swartz and her colleagues study the abilities of the bat in the sky by observing them flying in a wind tunnel. 
bats come from animals, ancestors that had five separate fingers. And those five separate fingers were used to control and manipulate lots of aspects of the environment around them. When bird wings evolved from dinosaur forelimbs, they lost any trace of grasping digits that used to be there. But it is these mammalian fingers that bats have retained that make bat flight so novel and so different from how birds fly. Bird wings are fixed and always in alignment, mirror images of one another. Bats, on the other hand, can use their fingers and nearly 20 joints to manipulate each wing separately, quickly altering the path it takes, more like the oars of a boat than the wings of a plane. This unique ability to control their wings has made bats the top guns of the sky. They can steer and break instantaneously and are able to change their direction up to 10 times faster than a bird. So when we look in the night sky and see bats darting in a riot of angles and speeds, what we are seeing is not the loss of control, but in fact, the mastering of it. But it is when we see bats taking to the sky that represents something else unique about their power of flight. They are one of the few vertebrate flyers that have mastered the night sky. Dr. Jim Simmons of Brown University says a simple environmental factor may have driven them there, predation. At night, there are huge numbers of insects that have evolved to be active in part to avoid being attacked or eaten by birds. The bats are out now exploiting this huge resource of the insects that fly at night without any serious competition. While food may have driven some bat species into the night sky, how do they do it? Don't forget, they're flying in total darkness. So for the most part, visual information isn't even available to them. What traits have they developed to allow them to navigate in the dark? For some bat species, the answer is a built-in sonar device, echolocation. Echolocation is the process where animals call out to the environment and listen to the echoes of those calls that return from various objects in front of it. In bats, these calls are on a frequency too high to be heard by the human ear. This radar-like system gives bats an advantage when navigating at night. Aside from bats, only whales and dolphins have evolved this system. And bats are the only flying animal to use this technique to navigate their way through the skies. In his lab, Simmons shows just how precisely a bat can fly in total darkness. The chains serve as obstacles, and the bat's chore is to fly in here and maneuver around the chains using its sonar, just the way it has to maneuver around the vegetation by the pond. Now, the chains are black and the room is black. When the bat is flying, the lights are off and it's completely dark in here. So the bat is forced to use its sonar instead of any residual vision that it might have. Here we go. No matter how many times Simmons moves the chains to create new obstacles, the result is the same. The bats safely navigate from one side of the room to the other in total darkness, relying only on their echolocation. These nocturnal flyers have evolved to use their ears almost in the same way as an eagle uses its eyes, to detect prey in the air. This highly evolved system is what allows bats to live and fly very successfully in total darkness. One of the things about the evolution of bats is that you can't treat their flight as separate from their echolocation and their hearing. The two go together. The two work so well together that over a thousand species of bats have radiated out across the world. Along with over 10,000 species of birds and over a million species of insects, our skies are bursting with flight both night and day. The ability to fly is arguably the evolutionary outcome that has most grabbed the human imagination. And by studying the amazing features of the four different flying animals, pterosaurs, insects, birds, and bats, humankind has been able to do what they once thought was impossible and take to the skies. 
but our man-made machines pale in comparison to the true marvels of natural flight. Due to spectacular evolutionary advancements over millions of years, land and water are no longer the only places evolved suddenly around 350 million years ago. Mutations in natural selection produced the first species with wings capable of lifting them into the air. This random evolutionary accident can now be seen in the anatomy of more than a million insects. Their wings have evolved to be like curved long helicopter blades, and the wing surfaces are not flat, which make them highly maneuverable in tight spaces so that they can easily find food and escape predators. Insects are very good at flying. They can hover, they can fly quickly, they can fly backwards, they can turn very tight turns, they can go very, very high, and they've taken advantage of this to fill all the different niches in the world. Although insects would be the first animals to fly, they would not be the last. To fly, an animal not only has to get up into the air, but once there, it has to be able to take in huge amounts of energy and oxygen to power them through the sky. Considering the physical demands, it's no wonder that the heaviest flying animal today, the great bustard, weighs in at a mere 45 pounds. If you watch birds of different sizes, especially when they try to take off from the ground, the first thing we usually notice is that large birds have trouble. I just want it. It is evolution's most inspiring achievement, the power of flight. From insects to birds to bats, tens of thousands of species fill our skies. But hundreds of millions of years ago, flight did not exist. This is something that's only occurred four times in all of the evolutionary history on the planet. How did these animals come to seemingly defy the laws of gravity? How did they first take flight? of millions of species, and the fastest of all of them, the peregrine falcon. Reaching speeds of more than 200 miles per hour, this bird swoops down from more than a half a mile in the sky to attack with lethal precision. The peregrine's tremendous speed and success at hunting can be attributed to birds. These first vertebrate flyers did not have feathers, but skin that stretched from their pinky fingers to their backs to form a wing. The first vertebrate group to fly, to evolve flight, were the pterosaurs. So they're closely related to dinosaurs, but not dinosaurs themselves. The world of the pterosaur was a strikingly different place than today. Dinosaurs tower above the canopy, while down below, millions of insects buzz around their feet, along with hundreds of species of reptiles, all competing for resources and food. The ability to fly opened up numerous new ecological possibilities for pterosaurs. One of the earliest ones was probably the ability to catch flying insects on the wing. So these guys could fly, pursue flying insects, grab them and eat them. Pterosaurs also look to oceans and lakes as a source of food. They fly over the water, swooping down for fish. Being in the air also gives them a better vantage point for spotting dead animals to scavenge. New food resources explain the desire for wanting to get up into the skies. But just how did these 440-pound behemoths get there? How an animal this big got off the ground and stayed into the air has been a puzzle ever since getting off of the ground. But one of the world's first flyers would break all the evolutionary rules about size. The first group of vertebrate flyers would produce the largest flying animal of all time, a 440-pound pterosaur called Quetzalcoatlus. This is Quetzalcoatlus. 
the largest flying animal of all time. With a wingspan of about 35 feet, this animal soared over Western North America. When in full flight, its wingspan was equal to three cars parked bumper to bumper. Imagine that thing coming at you. The gigantic pterosaur had a huge beaked head the size of a human, and when standing on the ground, was taller than a giraffe. At four times the size of any flying animal today, it's an anomaly of evolution. What ecological pressures drove these enormous animals into the sky? And how was it physically possible? Weighing hundreds of pounds, it seems unlikely even its massive wings could have generated enough force to drive it into the air. Pterosaurs lived 220 million years ago and were the first vertebrates to evolve powered flight. Their name comes from the Greek pterosauro, meaning winged lizard. Unlike one simple trait, the power of flight. While humans have always dreamed of flying, evolutionarily, flight has passed us by. But incredibly, more than three quarters of all land animals can take to the air. From butterflies, to birds, to beetles, and bats. These vastly different organisms have all evolved the complex mechanism of getting and staying airborne. Flight occurs when an animal has enough lift and thrust to move its body through the air and to maintain it in the air. But what forces drove the development of such a remarkable innovation? When did the first animals take to the air? And how did they develop this ability to seemingly defy the laws of gravity? The sparks of this extraordinary evolutionary change can be seen all around us today. Insects. For millions and millions of years, nothing could fly. And so if a small invertebrate was moving around in the forest and wanted to find food, it had to crawl all the way up to the top of a tree and get the food and then go down that tree and up another tree to get food. But then suddenly something happens. The first flying organisms appear. And once flight becomes part of the game, it changes everything. The fossil record shows that insect flight evolved.